Welcome to Your Family's Health, the program that focuses on health care issues with unique and different modalities for taking charge of your health today. Experts talk weekly with our continuing roster of guests from around the country and right here in Nassau County to keep you up to date on the latest health issues and trends. Take care of your mind, body, and soul. Spend the next half hour with the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC, and get on the journey to better health. Hello and welcome to Your Family's Health. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at Nassau Community College, along with nursing student Gina Peters. And today we're talking about how to prevent pressure injuries, often the number one reported patient harm in health systems. I'd like to welcome to the show Martin Burns, the CEO of Bruin Biometrics. Martin, welcome to Your Family's Health on the voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here and to meet both of you. So first of all, I hope you're doing well. Can you tell us how you might have been personally affected uh, by COVID-19? Thanks for asking. Uh, Myself and my family are doing very well, thank you. Um, We closed both of our offices for our company back in February. Actually, right around the 22nd of February, we closed. Uh, We required that everybody work from home. And to the extent that we were doing clinical implementation work, we were then shifting over to using Zoom and Microsoft Teams and other methods for training so that we weren't putting uh, our staff at risk. And equally, we weren't getting in the way of nurses who were doing service redesign work at the time. So we, we pretty much withdrew at, from being on site. Thankfully, of the team that we had, we only had three people develop COVID and they all have now recovered and are back at work again. So can you tell us about Bruin Biometrics? Like what's your company all about? Yeah, we were founded in 2009. And the idea was that there are a number of healthcare disease states that have got very poor diagnostic standards. And because they've got very poor diagnostic standards, think about that as being either late or with poor sensitivity and specificity. So so as a practitioner, you're left guessing. And so what happens is, is that because those disease states are left until they're too late, they're they're essentially already manifest. What happens is, is that the window of opportunity to apply preventative actions has closed. And so what we did was in collaboration initially with the UCLA healthcare practitioners here in, in Los Angeles, is that we chose a number of disease states, and I call them disease states, but there's, there's no better way of describing them, but just things that, that occur, that, that, are, that require treatments. We, we focused on a number of them. The first one that we really picked and went hard after was this issue of, as you called it at the beginning, pressure injuries. They were then known as pressure ulcers, and most commonly are known as bed sores. So we looked at that, and actually there are, fundamentally three major problems of diagnosis for bed sores. Problem number one is a problem where the damage is occurring from the inside out. And what happens is, is that you can't see that damage using the current standard of care. And so the current standard of care relies on visual inspection and for nurse practitioners to do palpation tests. And unfortunately, it doesn't matter how good of a nurse you are, no nurse can see cellular level damage occurring underneath the skin surface. So you only really are able to observe it at the point at which it manifests at the skin surface. So that's problem number one. It starts from the inside out and you can't see that until it's manifest. Problem number two is, even when it is manifest at the skin surface, it's quite confounding to be able to get a proper diagnosis. So a bed sore is an area that presents on the skin as being, and are you ready for this? This is the actual formal uh, definition uh, of the earliest stage of a bed sore, which is stage one or category one. It's an area of skin and tissue, which is, uh, has non-blanchable erythema. In other words, it doesn't go white when you depress it. It can be hot or cold. 
it can be boggy or stiff. And when you look at it, you think, well, actually, hang on a second. If I'm a nurse practitioner, how on earth can I tell whether my patient's skin is red or not, cold or not, or hot, uh, or spongy or, and boggy or stiff? And what am I left with? Well, I'm left with quite a confusing state that actually also is confounded with incontinence-related dermatitis, which sometimes can look like, to the untrained eye, like a bed sore. So that's problem number two. And problem number three is if you've got patients who are dark skin toned, good luck, because you can't see redness at the skin surface until such time as it's so badly deteriorated that you either have a blood-filled blister or you have broken skin. Uh, And what that means is is that essentially dark skin toned patients typically are diagnosed at the category two level, meaning the broken skin level. And once the skin breaks, as you, Gina, will know being a nurse practitioner, and Janine, you'll know just based on your practice, once the skin breaks, all hell breaks loose. You're at that point where you've essentially uh, uh, allowed the barrier that is the skin uh, to allow in infections. And that can be localized site infection. It can go down to osteomyelitis into the bone. Uh, and then it can become systemic in the form of sepsis. So it's the kind of thing that in, in our definition of prevention, and I think this is the thing that really became clear for us in the last sort of 12 months, our definition of prevention is keep skin intact. So that's what we focus on as a business. The journey has been fascinating and a real journey of collaboration, not just with practitioners here in the United States, at UCLA, uh, at at, uh, research sites all across the country, Providence, uh, the VA, uh, and so on, all across the United States. But actually, we're also global. And so we operate in the United Kingdom, in Ireland, uh, in Australia and New Zealand, and we're just about to announce a major expansion to other areas of the world. But part of the journey for us has been collaborating with the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And although your viewers can't see that or your listeners can't see it, I'm sort of grinning because I'm actually part Irish. And it gives me tremendous uh, satisfaction to work with the guys in Dublin who are just terrific researchers. And we also do a lot of research in Israel uh, through the University of uh, Tel Aviv. So it's been a terrific journey. The last comment I'll make here in this section is just to let you know that we were, the, we were and are the first organization to take a device like this through the FDA's regulatory pathway. And as of today, we are still the only device that the FDA's authorized for the purposes of providing this kind of information about bed sores, pressure injuries to practitioners. Thank you for the work that you're doing for prevention of pressure injuries, a very pervasive issue that we're seeing both in the healthcare facilities as well as the home environment. However, what is the device that we're talking about? Can you describe for me the device and how that prevents pressure injuries? Yeah, so the device is about the size of your Apple iPhone, if you have one of those. It has a sensor on it. And the sensor is, it uses physics to detect changes in moisture levels underneath the area of the sensor. So here's the intuition that you should have. A bed sore, a pressure injury, is a wound. And as long as you don't bleed, all wounds go through the inflammatory phase. There are a number of extremely unique situations where inflammation will not occur. But for the moment, if you can just go with me that substantially all wounds will go through an inflammatory phase. That's enormously helpful information. Inflammation is a buildup at the particular bony prominence. So bed sores occur or pressure injuries occur over known areas. So heels and sacral areas account for north of 80% of all reported pressure injuries. Now, because of COVID, and we'll come on to that, I'm sure, later, you'll have seen uh, healthcare practitioners with what look like bruises uh, on their faces, on the bridge of their nose and on their cheekbones from all of the medical equipment. Those aren't bruises, actually. Those are the early stages of pressure injuries. In any event, what's going on is there's an inflammatory response going on locally. 
That inflammatory response is a result of vasodilation, bringing extra inflammatory fluid to the site as a response to those inflammatory markers like cytokine uh, and uh, you know, interleukin 1 alpha and so on. And what's happening is, is that in the interstitial space, the space between the cell structures, there's a buildup of fluid. And as a result of it, you end up with a microscopic buildup of fluid, microscopic. But then if it's left unchecked, becomes macroscopic. How do you, and so that's great information. And so the question is, given the fact that we know that wounds go through that phase and the pressure ulcer is a fairly uh, uh, anatomically specific event, can we use that information, that inflammatory marker, as information that nurse practitioners and others can use to detect abnormal changes underneath the skin and tissue, in the tissue? Answer, yes. And the way that we do it is we use biocapacitance. So capacitance, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep this at a level that I hope is understandable, is essentially the ability of a material to hold on to an electrical charge uh, and so if you think about it, air is a very poor conductor of electricity, but water, by contrast, is great. So what happens is, is that when you introduce materials with a higher uh, capacitive value in contact with the sensor that's on our device, you end up with essentially a number that reflects that change in uh, moisture underneath the sensor. So what we were looking for was a buildup of moisture, a higher value, and we found that in our research, and actually not just our research, it's also research that had been done in Berkeley, at UCLA, in South Korea, all over the place. And so what happens is, is that you end up with values on the screen that reflect changes in moisture content underneath the area of the sensor as you apply it to the bony prominence. Now, that all sounds hideously complicated. And in some instances, actually, it is quite complicated. It, it, you know, when you really look at the uh, at the physics of it. But practically speaking, the device is used by a healthcare assistant. Um, it takes less than a second to be able to take one reading. There is training involved to help the, the user know where to apply the sensor and how to apply the sensor so you get a good, reliable reading. But it's very fast, and the device does all the calculations for you so that you don't actually have to do any... Uh, at manual calculations. All you have to do is know how to interpret the number and then what to do with the number. You asked about how does it achieve prevention? And let me address that and then I'll come back to something else. How does it achieve prevention? Well, what it's doing is it's giving the, the practitioner information about abnormalities that exist underneath the skin in the tissue. And with that information, even though the skin may not look damaged and may not be damaged and red, what happens is, is that if it's left unchecked, it will go on to develop a pressure injury. What it's doing is giving the nurse confidence that at the anatomy, that the skin and tissue is compromised. And all you do, therefore, is that you're using your clinical judgment as a nurse practitioner or as a healthcare assistant to be able to say, you know what, I know that something's not quite right about my patient's left heel, as an example. It doesn't look like it's damaged, but I know my patient is at risk. So I'm going to take action on my patient's left heel. So what the device does, and this is where it departs from the current standard of care, is that it gives anatomy-specific indication of risk. My patient's left heel is exhibiting abnormal values. It gives it early, so before any signs of redness. And what it's doing, therefore, is giving the, the practitioner the opportunity to take action of that specific anatomy. And when you take action, what happens is, is that you can then, you open up this window of opportunity to stop the patient's skin and tissue going past what the literature calls the damage threshold. In other words, a point at which the damage builds up to such a point where ischemia occurs, lack of blood flow, hypoxia occurs, a lack of oxygen in the blood, and then you end up with necrosis. So that deterioration and breakdown of the cell structure in the tissue. So what you're trying to do essentially is use the data to reverse and rescue the skin and tissue and then allow the skin and tissue to, to return to what's referred to as hemostasis, 
or normal operation. Now, what are the interventions? Well, at this point, the interventions, I say at this point, at this point in the damage cascade, the interventions are actually pretty basic. What you're trying to do is alleviate and alleviate pressure, mobilize the patient's anatomy, get the blood to be able to reflow back in again, and then generally take care of the patient so you're not causing, as an unintended consequence, a buildup of pressure somewhere else. So if I stick with my left heel example, what do you do? Well, when you have a patient who's deemed to have developed a, a stage one pressure ulcer, the range of things that a practitioner can do are offloading at that particular anatomy, increase the turning regime from sort of 12 hours to eight hours to six hours to two hours, put the patient in a heel boot, uh, change the bed surface so you kind of go from a, a static bed to a hybrid bed surface to potentially a dynamic surface. And I'm sure you've seen those alternating, um, you know, surfaces that have bladders that increase and decrease in volume. Uh, make sure the patient's skin and tissue is dry. So you end up with this moisture wicking uh, uh, functionality in the bed surfaces. And then some pr practitioners will apply skin barrier creams as well to be able to help the skin maintain its integrity. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the Voice of NASA Community College 90.3 WHPC. My name is Dr. Janine cook -Award, along with NASA Community College nursing student Gina Peters. And today we're talking about how to prevent pressure injuries, often the number one reported patient harm in health systems with Martin Burns, CEO of Bruin Biometrics. So this is very uh, interesting. Um, now, you talked about a sensor. Now, this sensor, is it uh, once a week? Because usually when patients are admitted in hospitals, we kind of use a measure to determine whether they are at risk for pressure injuries. So at the point of admission, they're given a number. And we look at the Braden scale and, and a lot of different preventive measures that we do, particularly when we see that patients are predisposed to pressure injuries. Would this sensor be placed on the patient upon admission? Or is this some a reading that's done intermittently? Um, and where is the sensor placed? Is it on the bony prominence? Is it the sacrum? Because these are the pressure points. Uh, usually where pressure injury occurs. So is this something that's placed on the patient uh, from admission or is this something that um, is placed on uh, periodically? So you're quite right that, that the standard of care from the point of admission, and this is true, by the way, in acute and post-acute settings, very much relies on the use of risk assessment tools. There are 97 at last count of these risk assessment tools but the most common ones are Braden Scale, Norton, and Waterloo. And as you quite rightly mentioned, Braden is, is the one that I think most U.S. practitioners would refer to. The point of the, of the risk assessment tool is to determine how you stratify patients from the point of admission. Are you at risk for a pressure ulcer? Yes or no. And if you are, how at risk are you? When you are deemed to be at risk for a pressure ulcer, as you then went on to say, there's actually a whole range of things that happen to that patient after that point. Typically, their status is documented. They have a turning regime or a mobility regime. Correct. They may not have a different bed surface and so on. So the challenge with those risk assessment tools is that they are generalized in their assessment of risk. In other words, I have my patient, George. George is admitted he's got a fractured neck or femur, broken his hip. Uh, and he's been admitted into an acute care setting, and he's deemed to be at risk for a pressure ulcer. How at risk? Very. Okay, so now we know, based on that very high risk score, that George will receive this, uh, it's often referred to as a bundle of interventions that are designed to be able to be preventative. The challenge with those bundled interventions is that they're universal in the way that they're applied. In other words, they're whole body. So what happens is the nurse then will go and look at George's skin and tissue. And if there's no visible signs of redness or those temperature changes, hot, cold, or uh, skin stiffness, boggy, not boggy, then the interventions will typically remain at the universal level, whole body. 
And it's only when the patient is, has visible signs of damage that the anatomy will then be acted upon. So the risk assessment tool is great from the purpose of answering the question, is my patient at risk, yes or no? But what it doesn't do is ask the question, where is my patient at risk for a pressure injury? And because it doesn't ask the question, it can't answer that question. So as a practitioner, you're left guessing. I don't know where on my patient they're at risk for a PU. That's what skin and tissue assessment's for. But as we talked about earlier, it's too late. Now, so what the sensor then, the scanner then does, is it provides information that's anatomy specific to the nurse about the status of the skin and tissue for every single scan. You scan on admission. We have a 24 hour rule here to be able to do present on admission testing. And that if you miss that window and the patient then goes on to develop a PU or a pressure injury, oftentimes it's then deemed to be the fault of the facility. And that's true in acute and it's true in post-acute. So what we're adding here is information that's used on admission and it's really specifically related to uh, grade one pressure ulcers, so the ones with intact skin but with redness. And then also what's referred to, as I'm sure you've seen these before in your practice, what are referred to as suspected deep tissue injuries. DTIs are the worst of the worst because they're what's, what are referred to as cavitated or undermined ulcers, where so much of the damage occurs underneath the skin surface that once the skin breaks, you end up being able to see the bone. So you get massive necrosis at the site. So what we're doing is basically on admission, giving the patient, giving the nurse the, patient, the, the information about the patient's anatomies. We recommend when we have clearance to scan the heels and the sacral areas specifically because they account for nearly 90% of all reported pressure injuries. And then what happens is, is that once the patient is in the care pathway, the, the guidelines often say, repeat your visual skin and tissue assessment daily depending on the level of risk, or on change of condition. So our users are repeating the assessment at least daily and acute. When it comes to ICU, ITU, they're doing it on every change of shift. Why that frequent f- frequency? Well, simply because that's how they do their skin and tissue assessment. So you do it concurrent with the skin and tissue assessment. The other thing that's being done is for uh, in perioperative settings, so pre and post operational settings, where the patient is going in for a period of surgery, what you want to be able to do is to be aware that if a patient is going to be lying on a bed surface, a surgical bed surface for four hours or more, they are 80% likely to develop a stage one pressure injury. So what we're doing is we're basically giving the information before the operation and immediately afterwards so that the nurse practitioners who are then responsible for care know exactly what's going on with that patient's anatomies. We have a number of care settings, particularly in oncology, uh, where they're actually using the device in the operating setting as well. Why are they doing that? Well, because the operations are so long. What you don't want to have is a patient going in for a 15 or 16 hour brain tumor surgery, which is successful, and then dying of a grade four pressure injury that's been infected. But I'm wondering, how how can that be prevented if particularly you talked about surgery and certain positions that a patient has to assume for a particular uh, surgery? They have to remain in that position in order to allow that surgery to be successful. So I'm thinking, how would the sensor, therefore, help in that case? The science of keeping skin and tissue intact is showing that Mobility, even modest mobility, has a huge impact on being able to get blood flow back to the site. Uh, You're quite right that some patients are simply not able to be moved. So actually, the the latest um, preventative action is in using uh, multi-layer dressings, which which have an additional cushioning effect, and they reduce the effect of shear, so that lateral side-to-side movement. So those help quite a bit. And then actually what happens is that immediately after, so post-operatively, by taking the scan, you're then able to show, okay, I know that my patient's left heel uh, was overexposed to to pressure. Let me focus on the left heel. 
And that's where you end up with the offloading, mobility, heel boots, and so on. And this particular uh, device, it's used, it can be also used in the hospital as well as the home setting. It's used in, it's currently being used in hospitals, in skilled nursing facilities, long-term acute care facilities, and in the hands of a practitioner, in other words, a qualified practitioner, in patients' homes, yes. And actually, the thing I'm most pleased about is it's also being used in end-of-life palliative care settings as well. Um, Do you have any examples of success stories using the scanner? There are many, some of which have now been published. Uh, We have a dedication to the publication science. And I I think that probably the, the, the one that I can point you to, which was published some time ago, was in Canada. So this was in Toronto. And essentially it was done under the direction of Rose Raisman, who's the wound ostomy continence leader there. Rose managed to achieve a 90% plus reduction in the incidence of reported grades two through four pressure injuries over a period of nearly a year by just deploying the scanner in the care pathway. And that's published. Now, there are a number of others that have just been published. They're UK based, where we've been operating since 2014, where in the community and people's homes, they managed to reduce the incidence by about 27%. There is a publication at the moment that will be published in November that's showing for an acute care centre in London. And this particular acute care centre is a bit like, sort of think about the Mayo Clinic or Northwell or, you know, one of the big name acute care centres with incredible expertise. They managed to achieve in uh, uh, between, in four wards, between either a 90% reduction or 100% reduction compared to the prior 12 months for exactly the same wards. So, Mr. Burns, how can we get in touch with you um, uh, if uh, the listening audience wants to reach out to you about this device? So the best ways are through our websites. So our company website's called bruinbiometrics.com, which is B-R-U-I-N biometrics.com. But the other one is if you just Google SEM scanner, S-E-M, so uh, And then we have a website, which is sem-scanner.com. All the contact information is there and we're hyper responsive. So typically what happens is people get a response back within a few hours. So it's not like one of those inboxes that you send an inquiry into and three months later you get a response. No, no, this is about an hour later you'll get a response back, even over the weekend. And we do that because, as you said right at the very beginning, this is such an important issue that we don't mess around when it comes to professionalism. We want to thank you for being here, Martin Burns, the CEO of Bruin Biometrics, and we hope you stay safe and continue to do great work. Thank you. As you can tell, I could talk about this all day because I just get <laughs> This is Dr. Janine Cookrod from the nursing department here at NASA Community College, along with the nursing student, Gina Peter. And we want to thank you for listening to this week's edition of Your Family's Health. We'd like to get your feedback on your family's health. Send your comments by emailing them to whpc at ncc.edu. Podcasts of today's show are available on iTunes, Android Podcasts, and Spreaker. This program was produced at the studios of Nassau Community College in cooperation with the nursing department. Join us next week for another edition of Your Family's Health on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.